Hello and welcome to this lecture and this video. Today we are dealing with the question of how sustainable is nature conservation. And we will do this um, using the recolonization of grey wolf into Central Europe. Uh, using this example to show you uh, several aspects of the question of sustainability and nature conservation. Let's have a short look back into the history. We have <clears throat> more than 100 years actually in Germany actual um, official nature conservation efforts until today. And more than 40 years we have the CITES contracts and so we can ask the question how successful we are or we were. Another question is um, an observation and an example nearly in every textbook of nature conservation of today. We had in Kenya in the 1970, it was 1973, a hunting ban. So before 1973, big wild animals, the so-called charismatic megafauna, uh, was regularly hunted on the basis of hunting contracts. And the hunters were responsible for conservation, to say it in short. Then, in 1973, it was, in my opinion, it was uh, Kenyatta, first President Kenyatta, who um, banned hunting. The reasons should be not discussed here, they are quite difficile. And in the following decade, we can observe, or we could observe, could have observed a decrease of up to 95% of the charismatic megafauna. So the renos nearly disappeared, elephants decreased, all the large predators decreased and so on. So the effect of this hunting ban was not an increase, but a decrease of the animals. And this is um, an observation we have until today that uh, a lot of nature conservation policy measures did not work and do not work. And we have a lot of, say, symbol policy also, especially in Africa. For example, this ivory boning, I will give some comments later on on it. Um, and especially in Africa, we also have today a lot of people, a lot of experts also, and a lot of political people who are blaming the activities of international nature conservation by states or by NGOs as a kind of neocolonialism. And these complex uh, I would like to enlighten a little bit on an uh, example from Central Europe and we will see how nature conservation will work or will maybe also not work in Central Europe using the recolonization of grey wolf and other charismatic animal uh, as an example. Yes, actually we have uh, this discussion about ivory burning, what means that, so the uh, ivory confiscated from the poachers um, stored in uh, some um, magazines uh, is not allowed to be sold um, on the international market, for example, to refinance nature conservation, for example. It's not allowed, so this ivory um, has to be destructed and this is done regularly on these, yes, say, um, very uh, 
drastic or um, very impressive actions of burning these big pillars of ivory. And a lot of experts, for example, also Dr. Wolf Krug, say that this will not help saving elephants. And maybe the opposite is true, because um, these goods with a very high price on the black market will, by destructing it, will increase prices on the black market. So maybe it would be better to legalize selling of this confiscated ivory and reinvest the um, income from that into nature conservation projects or something like that. But actually, we have these spectacular actions with no benefit for nature. And let's ask another question. Nobody knows how many tons are in the books, or we know how many ton, tons of ivory are in the books of such a magazine, but nobody knows how many tons are burning. So this is a question of corruption, maybe. Another problem, actually, especially in Africa, is the uh, so-called battle inside CITES. It's a lot of conflicts inside nature conservation. Um, for example, between the South African conservationists on the one hand and the animal rights NGOs on the other hand. And so if we have to assess sustainability on a fact basis, we have to ask what is our framework, what should we keep in mind, what should we look after, and um, what um, kind of processes and kind of uh, actions are required for that. Basically, maybe you all know that, um, is uh, we have the three pillar model from the so-called Brundtland definition. So it means that sustainability has an economical, an ecological, and a social cultural aspect. And this name Brundtland definition um, it comes from Mrs. Gro Harlem Brundtland. She was, I think, twice or three times um, Norway um, prime minister. But uh, her impact on sustainability comes from the report. It was written not personally by her, but it's called the Brundtland Report. It's um, called our, or it's uh, overwritten our common future, and there this uh, definition of sustainability um, has been used consequently uh, one of the first times. Yes, uh, assessing of sustainability also has a background of society and of culture. You know, um, sustainability is maybe um, assessed in another way in Southeast Asia or in Africa or in Europe or in North America. So the cultural background is important and the sociological background is important. And also the objects of uh, assessing sustainability are very different, different and very many. So we can look at the sectors, for example, say hunting, fishery, um, nature conservation, and so on. We can look on the laws, on the legislation, on the laws and orders. We can look on processes. We can look on concepts. We can look on structures, and even we can look on whatever we call products. 
So maybe the question is, what is a product of nature conservation? Is nature a product or is nature maybe uh, a precondition for nature conservation? Then the next question is, do we have a holistic or a reductionistic approach? Maybe this you will hear um, in another class and lecture. Um, where are the boundaries of the system? Um, we have to determine about valuation issues. We have to determine about databases. And we have to create participation and transparency. This is maybe in short some framework of assessing sustainability. It's not a complete framework. Okay, let's come back to our example and let's come back to the question what is a charismatic megafauna. Um, charismatic megafauna um, is our large animal species. Um, they have a widespread popular appeal. Uh, charismatic megafauna are animals, they are well known. Most people can recognize them. And they have the potential to fascinate and to emotionalize the people. And so um, these animals are attractions to logical gardens. Certainly they are attractions also for that what we call ecotourism. Ecotourism is not so well defined. And they also attraction to hunting tourism, for example. And what is charismatic, charismatic megafauna also depends on the region of the world. So in Africa, for example, an animal of the size of a wolf is not megafauna. Um, it's kind of mesofauna, but elephants are their megafauna and the antelopes maybe are mesofauna. In Europe, Central Europe, we have not so much so big animals. So our megafauna, for example, is moose, is red deer, is European bison, is uh, alpine ibex, as you see in the photo, or is even uh, brown bear or gray wolf. <clears throat> And maybe you know that a lot of our charismatic megafauna of our megafauna has become instinct in the um, extinct in the past. So the reasons for these extinction processes are different, and there are many reasons, but it depends on the species or the category of species, what reasons did work on this extinction process. So very often we find habitat losses. So the question if the big um, European bison, it became nearly extinct in the 17th, 16th century, maybe habitat losses, deforestation, and so on, are responsible for this extinction. Or maybe also overexploitation. Another example, the moose, maybe not overexploitation, but climatic changes should be um, also a reason of um, becoming extinct in certain parts of Europe. So because in other parts of Europe, in the north or in the east, this animal species is increasing. And the predators, especially the gray wolf, um, are kind of victim of a society um, with a very small scale agricultural livelihood um, in the huge majority of rural populations in the 19th or 18th or 17th century. So these very small farms of two or three hectare in size, um, of a lot of small livestock keeping an owner of a sheep or an owner of a goat was a rich man, and um, an owner of a cow or two was a quite very wealthy man. 
So it was not hunting, not especially not regular sustainable hunting that um, did extinct gray wolf. Um, it was a kind of so-called pest control. So the management concept of Yes, until the early 20th century was very simple. It was kill every wolf you will see. And we will see later on that our actual management concept, it's the opposite. It's, we can call it, don't do any harm to a wolf uh, independently what the wolf is doing. Um, is also failing. And especially with the gray wolf, the habitat losses are less important. So the gray wolf can, say, live everywhere. And until today, it is an additional um, aspect. Until today, we have a very ambivalent relationship to the wolf. So the wolf it's the same species as a domestic dog, and both uh, are living closely to human beings, the wolf in the wild and the domestic dog around uh, the people and in the houses of the people. And the uh, domestic dog is um, very positive, determined to man, and the wolf maybe is just the opposite. It's very interesting. Um, socio-cultural um, question. And we can see here some examples. For example, this mosaic uh, shows uh, the wolf as an uh, important part of the founding um, a global power of the Romans. And a very negative association with the fairy tales of the Grimm brothers they call this uh, Little Red Riding Hood tale. And here another um, art from um, Eastern Europe um, describing wolf as a beast, as a beast trying to kill man. And maybe here, all these uh, pictures are from uh, the book of Eric Tim. Um, here we have a uh, maybe quite realistic picture of wolf sitting around a settlement. The evening um, is coming down and they are waiting for some food somehow, somewhere. So let's think what could be the goals of nature conservation in the context of recolonization of gray wolf. We should be able to establish an adaptable population. And that means a population capable of a long-term survival. It should not survive maybe for some years or some decades. It should survive on a long-term basis. But on the other hand, we should have no unacceptable risks for man. So we can say, OK, this risk for man actually um, is not so much and so high. We have to say the risk is not zero, but uh, the risk to die by falling off a ladder in the kitchen is much higher than to be killed by a wolf. Um, we should have now unacceptable economic damages. We should have no unacceptable animal welfare problems, especially for domestic animals. And we should have no unacceptable conservation problems for other species. The latter is very interesting in the context of the move long. It's a wild sheep with the majority of the gene pool not in the original places on the Mediterranean islands, um, cores and Sardinia, but uh, the majority, the majority of the gene pool is um, in Central Europe in form of an introduced 
um, species of um, mouflon, and this species is eradicated by the wolf wherever the wolf appears in mouflon, before it disappears. And so we have also a conflict, an intrinsic nature conservation conflict here. And what is the recent situation? The recent situation is that Wolf is rapidly recolonizing colonizing, uh, Central Europe. Um, the animals are coming from a huge Baltic Eastern European population and partly also from a southern, say, call it Brutsu Alpine population. And they are very quickly recolonizing Central Europe. We will see it later on. We have an exponential growth of the wolf in parts of Poland and in parts of Germany, not in all parts of Germany, but in some parts. And we have increasing conflicts. We have management plans for wolf maybe since 10 years, a little bit more. And if we, on, and the, the, the role of the management plan is the primary role of the management plan is to um, avoid conflicts. And now we can see that we have increasing conflicts, especially with the small livestock breeders, the herdsmen um, have problems by sheep predated by the wolf. The farmers have problems with, say, cattle um, or sometimes horses um, predated by the wolf. And hunters also are not so happy, not all hunters are not so happy with the wolf, but in the group of the hunters, the conflicts are not so much, I think. Um, and maybe even not yet so much conflicts we do have in the local communities and the question of transport and traffic, but maybe these will be increasing in the future. So we um, had a lot of studies um, how will people um, react if wolf is more and more increasing, if wolf is, for example, to be seen in the villages, for example, to be in, in the center of the communities, maybe feeding from the rubbish tons and so on. So then um, we have the information um, from a lot of studies that people will um, no longer tolerate the species. And the other question is what happens if a herd of cattle or a herd of horses will uh, be involved in accidents, for example, on the motorway um, with uh, a lot of victims um, maybe also human victims in this situation. So this is fortunately not yet a problem, but uh, we have to anticipate these um, ideas and thoughts. Wolf is actually strictly protected according to supplement four of the FFH um, directive. This means a very strict protection. Um, this uh, supplement four normally does not allow a low, um, uh, regular utilization, for example. So this is a special case of some European countries, for example, of Germany, um, Italy, France, Poland, and some others. And another group of countries, uh, they um, keep the wolf in the Supplement 5 of FFH Directive, what means a regular ut utilization should be possible. For example, this is the case in the Baltic states, for example, Estonia. Here we have a short impression of the development of the wolf packs in Germany. We have an exponential growth and we 
will see um, that this number of animals is increasing even in the future and nobody knows where the boundaries are and we do not want to get these wolf um, population in Central Europe to the upper boundaries because nobody would like to know what will happen when the wolf reaches these upper boundaries. Because we know some examples from um, southeastern Europe, for example, from Romania, um, where grey wolf is uh, living in the villages and in the urban communities uh, quite regularly. And this would be not accepted here in Germany, as far as we know from our studies. Another very interesting problem in the context of sustainability and sustainability assessment is the question how do we deal with biological, biological facts or how do authorities uh, and politics deal with biological facts. So this um, graphic here you see is how nature conservation authorities and nature conservation NGOs um, are looking at the wolf in Central Europe. They assume that there is a lot of different so-called population, populations. Um, one Scandinavic, for example, one Central European lowland population, one Carpathic population, one Balkans population, one Baltic and one Karelic. And you see here, um, it is a very artificial boundary they made here. And this has nothing to do with the biological uh, term of population because the biological population means a um, group of individuals that are interbreeding and that are um, connected in a reproductive contact. And the biological population is that um, we can um, say that we have one single big so-called Baltic Eastern European population and um, the wolf in Central Europe is to be um, recognized as the westernmost outpost of this big um, Baltic Eastern European population. And this is a number of 10,000 of individuals. And then in addition, yes, we have another Iberic population without regular mating contact. And maybe we have here uh, what we call Abruzzo, Alpine population. But we have not, in a biological point of view, we have not this multiplicity of so-called population as policy and as um, authorities uh, will do. So we can ask why do they um, subdivide this wolf population? So we can speculate maybe um, a huge number of small population means that every one of these so-called smaller populations will be a little bit more endangered as we um, find it here in the reality of biology. And maybe, say, let's go back. Maybe this picture helps politically to keep the status of protection high. Maybe, I do not know. But the problem is we have a different, a completely different approach uh, to the fact what is our population. And in my opinion, we should, and we, not we should, we have to do it only from a biological aspect, not from a political um, aspect. Yes, another problem we have is the increasing attacks on um, domestic livestock. Here we have a transparency um, I got uh, from Henrik Okama, my colleague, from uh, Krakow, from Poland. And this uh, transparency shows for France the increase 
of wolf attacks on livestock and on increase of victims and the increase of compensation payments. So it's up to 2016 and in 2016 we are more than 3 million payments only for compensation. It's not the complete cost of the wolf. We will see it later on. And we have here a graphic that shows us an increase of wolf attacks on uh, livestock and very interesting um, the number of victims, the animals killed by wolf or injured by wolf um, is increasing much more quickly. And now have a look on the question of what are the costs of wolf. And in Germany, we do not find these complete uh, calculation of costs. What, what does wolf um, cost in our um, economy? Um, in France, they published um, some estimations and we see here an increase from 2004, it's the total cost of wolf, it's about 1.8 million of euros, and it's increased quickly until 2018 to 28 million of euro. It's only for France, and I think in Germany it is quite similar. And here we have the problem that these costs are costs to be paid by the taxpayer. It's not, um, there's no possibility to have a private um, institution or only in very few um, aspects, but normally this is to be paid by the taxpayer. This is completely different from hunting in Germany, for example. Um, in Germany, hunting is completely privately paid and even the protection measures for the animals underlying hunting legislation are privately paid. And that's what we call in Germany Hege. Um, that means the conservation measures for animals uh, under uh, hunting legislation. But the animals under nature conservation legislation, um, every costs have to be paid um, by the um, community, by the taxpayer. So we had seen only some examples. I think you have seen that nature conservation is not necessarily sustainable. There are a lot of problems, a lot of problems with economical sustainability, the problem who pays for these conservation measures. We have a lot of problems with ecological sustainability, even in nature conservation. Uh, for example, what happens uh, with species um, that become extinct by the occurrence of the wolf and much more important, the question, what happens with the um, nature conservation effects of grazing with small livestock, for example. So in Germany and other European, Central European countries, um, small livestock like sheep are mainly kept for nature conservation purposes, not so much for the meat or for other uh, utilizations like wool and so on. Uh, nature conservation um, is the job of the sheep. And if a lot of um, herdsmen will um, shut down their business due to increasing costs of um, avoiding wolf attacks, then we have also a lot of conservation problems by another species that is to be um, even also conserved. 
And the third aspect, um, the social cultural sustainability, it's also very interesting. I mentioned the double faced role of the wolf in our um, society um, over the last, um, yes, hundreds and thousands of years. So, wolf is well accepted by a part of our Central European population, especially more accepted by the urban part of society and less accepted by the more um, countryside, um, more agraric structured um, regions in Germany. But we see that there is no unique opinion pro or against wolf. And this has a lot to do with the socio-cultural backgrounds. So, if you have to ask, or you have to, if you have to answer the question, um, how sustainable is nature conservation, we can say, there is a good basis for sustainability, yes, but we have to improve a lot. We have to improve especially on the economic uh, part, but we have also to improve um, on the ecological and social cultural part. And how can we do that? For example, we can um, think about the question of uh, active management. Active management um, on a scientific basis as we find, for example, in uh, Estonia. There, a uh, wolf is regularly hunted and hunters are uh, paying a lot, not everything, but a lot of uh, the conservation costs. And we have quota and uh, the quota are uh, calculated every year uh, on the basis of a monitoring, a very intensive monitoring. So this should be one possible, not be uh, the only, but one possible solution. We have to avoid political taboos. So actually nature conservation is um, in a cage of a lot of political taboos actually. We need more independent research, not research um, only of confirmative character. So. Um, that the results will be known before we start the research. This is not the right way. The right way is um, uh, completely open-minded research. And last but not least, we will need more participatory processes. So we are in, especially in Germany, we are not so familiar with participatory processes. We know it from Africa, for example, or from other parts of the world, um, maybe from Central Asia, that people are very good in participation and um, they have very much, much more experience than we in participatory processes, in integrating people from the basis, in integrating farmers, integrating herdsmen, integrating um, the local tribes in Africa, for example, integrating even the poachers. And this uh, tradition is not so well established, uh, especially in Germany. Germany is thinking much more top-down thinking, so law and order thinking. And as we will see, and as we have seen in the context of wolf recolonization, this does not work um, in nature conservation with a wild animal. And so we need much more bottom-up processes than top-down processes like the old Preussen history and Preussen tradition established here in Germany. So this was in short um, uh, overview, some examples and some maybe ideas for further rethinking these questions, uh, especially uh, the question of nature conservation and how can we improve with nature conservation for the future for nature, for the animals, but also for the people. Thank you very much for your attention and bye-bye.